Rock Hudson is likely most remembered, whether he would have liked it or not, as the face of the AIDS epidemic that ravaged the gay community and many others during the 1980s and 90s. But his life wasn't that of a martyr, nor necessarily one of empowerment. Rather, Hudson was a man of his time who left an irreplaceable legacy in Hollywood history during his all too brief life. Born Roy Harold Shearer Jr. in 1925, Hudson was raised in the Chicago suburb of Winnetka. His father left the family when he was a young child and moved to Los Angeles. He was later adopted by his stepfather, who changed his last name to Fitzgerald. Hudson's stepfather was an abusive addict who violently discouraged the young man from acting. Roy went to Los Angeles looking to find his biological father after World War II ended. Prior to that, like many other young men in his generation, Roy served in the military during World War II. After graduating from high school in 1943, he enlisted in the US Navy instead of waiting for the draft, where he went on to serve as a mechanic in the Philippines. But come 1946, he was discharged in San Francisco and in close proximity to Hollywood, where he travelled south looking for his father. Living for a brief time with his father and a new family he'd started, Roy was working as a vacuum salesman like the old man and then as a truck driver after his father threw him out. They rarely ever talked to each other again. Still, things were about to look up for Roy after he was told by a male lover about Henry Wilson, the talent agent who discovered Lana Turner and previously ran David O. Selznick's casting apparatus, Selznick being the producer behind Gone with the Wind. Wilson had just recently opened up his own talent agency where he was signing and grooming bright young actors like Tab Hunter and Guy Madison. Those were of course not Guy or Tab's real names, but Wilson had a penchant for almost exclusively signing beefy young men whom he remade in his own image, including dubbing them with star monikers. He did the same for Roy after the young man sent him a headshot in 1947. Christening him Rock after the rock bird from Arabian folklore and Hudson after the Hudson River Valley. Wilson is credited with inventing Rock Hudson. Perhaps that's why Rock at first hated his new name. It stuck though, as did Wilson's other improvements, including capping Rock's teeth and deepening his voice. Wilson also introduced Rock to director and producer Raoul Walsh, who in another life helmed High Sierra in 1941 and Strawberry Blonde also in 1941, before the war. He also had the distinction of playing John Wilkes Booth in D.W. Griffith's KKK Love Letter, The Birth of a Nation in 1915. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. Like Wilson, Walsh was taken by Rock's good looks and signed him to a contract before casting him in his next movie, Fighter Squadron in 1948. A post-war aerial melodrama of the variety that would influence George Lucas in the years to come, the film provided Hudson with a small role that got even smaller when his scene was reduced due to legendarily bad acting. Despite having only one line, Hudson mangled it so badly that it had to be rewritten for him 38 takes later. Walsh soon passed Hudson over to Universal Pictures, where he received lessons in acting, singing, dancing, horseback riding and fencing. But perhaps the first sign that he was an actor to keep was how popular he became after doing a photo session for Photoplay magazine. Rock was thus soon promoted to leading man status after starring in Scarlet Angel in 1952 where he played a sea captain looking to get rich in the midst of post-Civil War melodrama in 1865 New Orleans. Afterward, Hudson became a go-to B-star at Universal, including in Taza, Son of Shoshis in 1954, a hilariously problematic Technicolor Western with Rock as the ripped son 
of an Apache Indian. Rock's career didn't take off, however, until he starred opposite Jane Wyman in Magnificent Obsession that same year, playing a man who became a doctor out of a sense of guilt after ruining another physician's career, Rock embodied a hunky sense of wounded nobility as he found atonement by curing the blindness of the woman he loved. The role led to a variety of great leading man parts, chief among them in George Stevens' Giant 1956. Stevens, one of the most versatile A-list directors in Hollywood, returned from World War II determined to make grittier, earthier dramas after all the adventure films and musicals he had helmed in the 1930s. Giant is a gripping drama about old Texas fading into modernity and a sordid love triangle between Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean. The movie infamously marks the third and final Dean performance before his death and it also began a lifelong friendship between Hudson and Taylor and netted Rock the only Oscar nomination of his career. After Giant, Hudson became one of the go-to leading men of the 1950s and early 1960s, including when he reluctantly was forced by Universal to star in Pillow Talk in 1959, a romantic comedy which co-starred Doris Day. Introducing sexual farce and mildly risque bedroom humour into the Hollywood romantic comedy formula, it became an instant classic of its genre and the template of several quasi-remakes he co-starred in with Day, including Lover Come Back in 1961 and Send Me No Flowers in 1964. During all of this time though, Hudson remained quietly, if not solitarily, in the closet. He did not have a steady long-term boyfriend during the early years of his life. Instead, he enjoyed a string of lovers. He is alleged to have looked across his film sets for other gay men he could summon to his trailer and had a rotating crew of manly companions who he always insisted could pass for straight and masculine like himself. Friend and gay author Armistead Maupin claimed Hudson would have sex sometimes multiple times a day with men he didn't know too well. It's perhaps this reason that Confidential magazine, the first widely read and nationally well-known tabloid, was able to dig up an expose on Hudson's private life with the intention of outing him as gay to the country in 1955. Agent Henry Wilson killed the story. Hudson's secret was safe for now, although he quickly married Wilson's secretary, Phyllis Gates, in an elopement that just so happened to have universal publicity photographers on hand. He then immediately did interviews with industry-friendly gossip columnists Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons to sell his marital bliss. To this day, there is debate among biographers about Rock and Phyllis's marriage, with some suggesting it was a lavender arrangement and that she was herself a lesbian, and others claiming there was affection. Others still say she blackmailed him for the divorce and to keep quiet afterward about his homosexuality. Whatever the truth, they did divorce three years later and Gates never remarried. Rock, meanwhile, found his life changing in the 1960s. Those slightly naughty sex comedies that seemed so provocative in John F. Kennedy's Camelot now looked hopelessly square by the end of the decade. Hudson also fired Wilson as his agent around this time, although by that point Wilson had given in to drug and alcohol addictions and unlike Hudson was publicly known as a gay man, making him a Hollywood pariah, particularly for new clients who did not want to end up on his casting couch or even just endure the rumours associated with it. Rock was also dogged by rumours of being gay. Indeed, the last red carpet he ever walked was for Ice Station Zebra in 1968, where hecklers in the crowd chanted homophobic slurs at him. Hudson didn't live with another man until his middle age in the 1970s. Moving in with publicist Tom Clark, Hudson drank more, smoked more, and gained weight. But he did find a new career in television and theatre 
after the movie studios stopped calling. Eventually, Tom Clark moved out of Hudson's home and in the 1980s, Hudson began an affair with the much younger Mark Christian, but he continued having other flings on the side, including one that proved fatal. In 1984, Rock received a call from a younger man he'd known the year before in New York. The acquaintance revealed he tested positive for HIV. Rock soon found out that he too had the virus that caused AIDS, but he refused to go public about it. In fact, that same year he visited old Hollywood buddies Nancy and President Ronald Reagan in the White House. Hudson apparently had a noticeable lesion caused by AIDS on his neck. He continued to try to work, however, appearing on Dynasty, where he insisted on faking his kissing scenes, as they didn't know how AIDS was transmitted then, and then by appearing on his friend Doris Day's new talk show in 1985. It was while on the latter that his noticeably gaunt appearance made the nightly news. Afterward, he flew to Paris for the second time to receive AIDS treatment by French doctors, but he became so ill in the hotel that he was immediately taken to the American hospital in Paris. There, his doctors refused to hide his condition from reporters, so only out of pure reluctance did Rock finally draft a press statement announcing he had AIDS. His French press agent said if it was Rock's choice, he'd never admit he had AIDS. Still, it became national news back home that shook middle America. Good-looking and handsome Rock Hudson, whom women loved, had the gay virus, which conservatives in the country treated as a moral affliction. Rock's pal Reagan refused to even personally acknowledge AIDS in public. Not that Rock ever publicly admitted he was gay. It was his friend Armistead Maupin who effectively outed Rock to the press. All his life, Hudson preferred the closet, even as it led to anxious tics like chewing on his nails until they were discoloured. As it was, Hudson announced he had AIDS in July 1985. He was dead by October. Nevertheless, his admission to having the disease forced much of middle America to begin reconsidering what they thought about AIDS as well as gay men. Rock Hudson's death gave AIDS a face. Not that it got Reagan to even publicly say the word AIDS until 1987, nearly two years after the disease killed his friend. Rock's life was a much more complicated and nuanced affair than Hollywood likes to imagine. A man defined by the attitudes and culture of the mid-20th century, a culture that left him to suffer in silence. Rock Hudson still helped provide wider acceptance in American culture for the dignity of gay men, as well as leading a career that has a shimmering legacy all of its own. It may not be the Hollywood story, but in its own way, it's a very honest one. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favorite Rock Hudson movie that you like the most? or a moment in his career that you keep on going back to. Let us know in the comments below, and if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.